Hello, my name is John Cornicello, and I welcome you to my series of live interactive photo conversations. You can check out the schedule at cornicello.com slash conversations for dates and times of upcoming shows. You'll also find links there to previous shows. Um, please note the next week's conversation with Art Wolf is on Wednesday, November 17th. Today, my guest is Joe Pobereskin. Joe and I met in the early 1980s when we were New York City photo assistants and getting started to transitioning out of assisting to our own studios. Joe went on to a career in advertising, corporate, and editorial photography, with assignments taking him around the world. He's now living in Chicago and joining us from there. So please welcome Joe Pobereskin. Thank you very much. We're all, all right, New so, Yorkers, so we talk fast. Yeah, so uh, I thought I'd show you guys some pictures. But before I do that, I think I'm going to do the reverse of what everybody else would do. Uh, and I'm going to roll the credits first uh, because without uh, without without people behind you none of this stuff ever happens if you know what I mean mm -hmm. so this is kind of my uh, my pedigree and um, and I, I only regret that I don't have a photograph of Ted Horowitz Ted was uh, a guy that I assisted for a couple of years and was really uh, made a major impact on, on what I do and how I do it. And for some reason, I'm embarrassed to say, I don't have a photograph of Ted anywhere. Wow. And if I do, I can't find it. So, uh, so forgive me, Ted Horowitz, if you're lurking out in the background, but uh, I don't have a picture of you, I'm sorry. I was really struggling to come up with a soundtrack for this, but there's no soundtrack. <laughs> Recognize a lot of those names. Well, some of them should be recognizable, yeah. <laughs> well, a number of the assistants that worked with me uh, went on to their own uh, illustrious careers. Some did not, uh, but that's the way that goes. Okay. So uh, we've seen the credits. Uh, I thought I'd start uh, just by giving you an overview of what my work's about, more or less. If anybody's got a question, just feel free to jump in and ask because uh, I don't know that I have answers, but I got <laughs> You make them up as we go. I'll make them up as we go along. So this looks like editorial work. Yeah, some of it is. Uh, this picture you're looking at, the baker, that, that was uh, that was from Document Brooklyn. This one of the uh, tutor and the student was for annual report to the United Way. This one here is the stock shop. That was for uh, Northern Telecom, now called Nortel Networks. That was for their annual report, as was this. This was an editorial yes. feature uh, in American Heritage Magazine. The story on fireworks. If, if people have questions, they can unmute themselves and ask. Who was the first photographer you assisted? Do you remember? The very first one was a fellow by the name of Carol Bromley. He was a fashion photographer. I had a job at a place called Commercial Studios, which was a big catalog studio, 257 Park Avenue South. Ninth, 10th, and 11th floors, mind you. And Bromley was their uh, chief fashion photographer. He did all the good location work. And, uh, and of course, it was all with 8x10. So very early on, I got to be an expert at loading 8x10 film holders really, really fast. I could load 100 sheets 8x10 flawlessly without dust in about What year were you at Commercial Studios? Oh, uh, 75 and 76, I think. Thank you. Yeah, you 1979 is when I started at Cranston Gould Studios over, was it 520 West 23rd Street? Yeah, that was the same idea. Yeah, yeah so it all, we started with 11 by 14 fashion and 8 by 10 for <laughs> Montgomery Ward. <laughs> yeah, we worked for Ward, worked for Penny, worked for uh, 
company called Alden's, which I think is a Chicago outfit. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple others, but uh, you know, after a year and a half or so, I was seeing the same layouts come across the desk. The difference was the models changed and the shoes changed, but the clothes were the same. And I got bored, and so I started looking for uh, other places to work. And I found one. Uh, I went to work for a guy, still that guy, by the name of Hashi. I spent three years, three and a half years in, in his uh, in his studio. Um, let me show you some more pictures. This is uh, what I would say is my latest ongoing body of work. This is stuff I photographed with my iPhone. Uh, it, it's wonderful. You can always have a camera with you these days. And uh, so these are all pictures made with that. I kind of think about this as like taking notes, you know. Uh, a lot of this stuff I will go back, like except for, for like this this thing. I mean, I'm not gonna go back and reshoot that, but uh, some of these things I can go back and reshoot with a real camera. And some of them are just uh, what they are. And so you you have seen uh, in the in the credits you saw that I worked for uh, worked for Hashi. I got recruited out of his studio by uh, Klaus and Luca. Uh, Klaus is a uh, kind of a lifestyle advertising photographer, uh, very popular in the, in the mid eighties. Uh, I worked for Klaus for a while. Uh, then I went to work for Bill Stettner. And then I went out and, and did some freelance assisting uh, and uh, did that for a number of years. I, I did that for 11 years. I was an assistant for 11 years, kind of a long time, but it gave me uh, the ability to develop expertise in, in a lot of different uh, things. So uh, that, that, was, that was the fringe benefit. And of course, uh, finally, uh, I ran out of people I wanted to work for. And that was the thing when I when I was a freelance assistant. At first, you know, anything that came along, I was up for. But after a while, if I didn't solicit you, you couldn't hire me. If you stood on your head, you couldn't hire me. The only people that I wanted to work with were the ones I worked with, and I worked every freaking day, uh, and at top dollar. So that was kind of a nice, uh, nice spot to occupy. But after a while, even that becomes, uh, you know. So where did FIT fit into this? I remember you going to school there. Well, I went to school, you know, I went to FIT, uh, had to go to college somewhere. And that's uh, Fashion Institute of Technology. Uh, yeah, it's 227 West 27th Street, New York City. That is the world's best free show. If you're ever <laughs> depressed and you think, uh, you know, life is Indeed. getting you down, I invite you to walk down West 27th Street and sit down on the, on, on the uh, ledge in front of the main entrance to the, the main building and just watch the world go by. And I guarantee you, uh, you're, you're yeah, another catalog practice. studio I worked at was NZS, and they were 275 7th Avenue, right across the street from FIT. So all our well, lunch That was right around the corner from where your studio was. I yeah, was and I was on 29th Street. You so we used to go for lunch and play Frisbee on the street well, at FIT yeah. and watch everything. Playing Frisbee on the streets, and I'm glad you said that, because uh, West 27th Street was closed specifically so students could play Frisbee in the street. And you want to know who made that happen? me <laughs> thank you <laughs> you're welcome because at the time when i was in my last year there i was the editor-in-chief of, of the newspaper of the of the weekly uh newspaper uh and uh and i wrote a lot of editorials and finally got them to to move on closing the street down it was dangerous there's all kinds of trucks and taxis and stuff coming down that street and people crossing in the middle of the block uh, etc and uh and of course we want to play frisbee so uh Mm -hmm. So I'm forgetting the cat calls. What's that? You're forgetting the cat calls of the construction workers while they were well, re yeah. rebuilding the new FIT. Well, that's part and parcel of New York City life. Yeah. So, what was your well, first client going out on your own from assisting, or while you were still assisting? Well, uh, the very first client while I was still assisting. Let's take our hats off to Mr. Chad Weckler. Uh, somebody came to Chad, uh, an art director at uh, International Gold Corporation, and uh, they were doing a series of ads, and uh, they wanted somebody to do it inexpensively. 
So they couldn't go to like, you know, an established pro. They figured, let's find out who's an assistant who's got something on the ball. So they asked Chad because he was in charge of the assistance committee at ASMP. And uh, he recommended me. So that was my first paying gig. Uh, and it, but it, in retrospect, was not enough money, but it was a good, good gig. It also made me learn, made me realize that I didn't want to be a fashion photographer after all. After all, after all the stuff I went through, trying to learn that business, I really decided I didn't want to do that. Um, I wanted to be out in the real world with real people. Uh, and I was uh, kind of uh, enamored of, of, of the idea that I could go into a factory or, uh, or a uh, place where they train astronauts, for example. You probably saw a picture of astronaut training I did for Northern Telecom. Uh, I had to go out to the middle of, uh, out to Denver, I had to fly to Denver and then drive out outside the city to the, to the foot of the Rocky Mountains. And, this, and, and that's where the Martin Marietta Denver Aerospace Plant was located. It was a kind of spot where you had a mountain behind you and all this open plain in front of you and you could see the Russians coming for miles, right? So it was a perfect place to put a top secret uh, uh, aerospace facility. Uh, I like being able to go into places like steel mills, coal mines, uh, astronaut training. I mean, you name it, places that other people just didn't get a chance to go, right? When was the last time you were invited into a coal mine? So, uh, of course, it comes with the downside. I remember going into a mine one time and first time and the foreman uh, has me sign in on this sheet. And he hands me a brass tag with a number on it. Tells me to put it in my pocket. And uh, I said, what's the tag for? And he says, well, when we find your body, we'll know whose mother to call. And that was really <laughs> confidence. Hey, stop your share for a moment so people can see you. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> All right. Can I, can I show some more? Yeah, please. If, and if you want to go through them as slower, you can too. Yeah, well, you know, I set to five I, seconds. I, I put them. I put them up as uh, I did them all as five seconds because I didn't figure anybody else was looking at it for more than five seconds. <laughs> uh, I did a project. Um, in fact, I'm going to I'm going to shift gears. Uh, go down here first. Uh, one of the interesting things that happened to me along the way was um, I had a couple of really uh, had a really good run my first year or two. Uh, I was working for Brides Magazine. I was working for American Express. Uh, I was work, did work for Choice Courier. I did work for Northern Telecom. A lot of, lot of interesting uh, corporate and, and industrial and a little bit of a fashion uh, business as well. But, um, and I nearly went broke doing all that because uh, I had so much money out on the street. I hadn't yet learned to get advances. I mean, that was... That was the thing. You have to always get an advance against your expenses. You cannot be a bank and be in this business. But uh, I got a lucky break. I, I uh, had been represented also by a stock, a small stock agency called Telephoto, uh, which was actually run by a woman who I had assisted. Uh, I'm not going to mention her name because I don't want to embarrass her. But uh, I made a little money. But one day I got a phone call from a guy whose name escapes me, Ted something or other. What I recall is that uh, he was located in Stevens Point, Wisconsin. And uh, he calls me up one day and he says, uh, look, uh, you're represented by Telephoto, right? I said, right. He says, well, uh, he says, uh, I was suspecting that I'm paid. And I got a hold of all their sales devices. Your name's all over this. You're getting paid for your stuff? We found out that they were stealing from us. So I started to look for other representation. And I found a company called uh, Tony Stone Worldwide, uh, run by a guy by the name of Tony Stone, in fact. Uh, and being hooked up with a really good stock agency meant I could shoot whatever I wanted to. And being that uh, I was based in New York, and New York was always available to me, I started shooting in New York. And I concentrated on icons, things that would sell. Uh, now, Jeff, uh, you might take note of the fact, I've been watching the Feline Fridays, the most popular uh, 
thing if you ever want to get a calendar published. And the most popular calendars, the most saleable calendars are pictures of cats. So if you want to make your cat a star, you could go right ahead and find yourself a good publisher. Uh, but after cats comes horses, and after horses comes images of New York. And I got in the calendar business for a while uh, on my own. Uh, but I did a series of images as part of my New York work uh, on, on the World Trade Center, and uh, which, which is what we're looking at now. And uh, the World Trade Center is visible from just about everywhere in New York City. It's even visible from Philadelphia. I went to to uh, join the, the National Board of the ASMP and uh, standing in front of their office on uh, on South Second Street, you could see the World Trade Center from there. So. Uh, it was a great icon, but when the towers came down, um, George Bush, then was the president, uh, wanted everybody to hang out an American flag. And so American flags started appearing everywhere. Now, I happen to like the American flag, number one, because I'm an American, it's a good flag. So I, I also like the Union Jack, uh, that's kind of a neat flag too. But uh, American flag is kind of special. So it's not just a great graphic, design, it's, it's a lightning rod for all, all kinds of uh, political discussion. And, uh, and so I started photographing flags, uh, hanging around everywhere. And I'll get into the flag project in a minute uh, after we finish with the towers, which as you might have guessed are no longer subject matter for anybody, regrettably. Were you in a helicopter on jobs when you when you um, took those pictures, or were you um, did you just book time on a helicopter? So the pictures you're looking at now, uh, those are that's that's me booking time in a helicopter at a thousand bucks an hour. Uh, and I, I'll tell you that you probably can't overfly Manhattan anymore. Um, I wasn't going to wait around for a client. To say, hey, let's do an aerial shoot. So I just did. But one of the interesting things about stock pictures is that once you know what to make pictures of, you can make a decent living. So I didn't have to worry about whether clients saw my work, called me on the phone, or any of that stuff. I was assigning my own projects to myself uh, and shooting whenever I wanted. And uh, yes, stock is dead now. Uh, that is absolutely true. Now you, you can't, you can't. That opportunity is not coming around again, um, and that's a shame because it was a great way to earn a living. Uh, and uh, those guys at, at, at Stone put put a lot of money in everybody's pockets. Uh, they really knew how to market images well. And they did a wonderful job, and I could shoot whatever the hell I wanted. I remember one time, uh, I, I had a friend, John. John knows uh, this woman. Her name is Penny Jen too. Uh, I told uh, Sarah Stone that uh, she ought to take a look at Penny's work because Penny was doing this remarkable stuff with babies and had no outlet. And uh, and so Sarah signed her up. And then uh, my wife and I had a baby. So I, I called in and I said, hey, I'm going to you know, shoot some babies. Uh, what do you need? And they, and they said, nah, forget that. We got Penny. We don't, we don't need you to shoot babies. But I shot babies anyway. And I made a, and I made a couple of iconic images of babies, uh, one of which I could probably show you, uh, which put my oldest son through college. And uh, more than put him through college, in fact. Uh, by the way, that flag on the beach that you just saw, uh, for those of you who are, would like to go to California, that's a Silomar Beach in Pacific Grove. Jeff and I were on a Silomar Beach about a week ago. That's why I mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> I happen to know that. <laughs> I happen to know that, so I, I think <laughs> I'd, I'd let you know. Uh, I didn't see that cool tree that you guys were photographing, but uh, I did see did get that. Oh, Um, anyway, the guys at Stone were able to put a lot of money in our pockets, and uh, mm -hmm. and I could photograph whatever I want. I decided at one point I wanted to go shoot stock in Washington D.C. I just took my assistant, got in a car, drove down to D.C., spent a few days, shot 
what we could shoot, you know? Uh, and I'd come back, edit it, send it in. They'd sell it. So uh, those were the days. Those were the good old days. And then they kept telling me, you know, you, they'd seen some pictures I'd done, some business pictures for customers, for clients. And they said, and I submitted uh, a couple of them. And they said, you know, you ought to shoot, you, you're good at this. You ought to shoot business meetings. So I started shooting my own business meetings. I'd get my friends. I'd find a location. I'd rent a location. I had all kinds of props, glassware, cups and saucers, uh, empty Chinese food containers, telephones, easels, laptops, all kinds of stuff. I could set up a conference room somewhere and shoot with, you know, my friend, cast my friends and, and do it that way. And that was, uh, that was kind of fun. Looking at the World Trade Center photos makes me think, did you ever work with Peter B? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I most certainly did not ever work with Peter B. And the reason why was because, uh, reason why was because you had to work, the hours had to be too long and, and uh, they didn't pay. And he tried to get me to work for him. He told me, he said, hey, let's, uh, let's go out. I want to take you out to lunch to make an offer you can't refuse. The offer I couldn't refuse was $95 a week for an 80-hour week. And he <laughs> took me to lunch at Blippi's, which wasn't exactly uh, haute cuisine. So, uh, so I turned him down. Uh, and I don't think it was a mistake because there was nothing he was going to teach me that I didn't already know. And so I what, was what were some of your most exciting or dangerous assignments, either as an assistant or as a photographer? Uh, well, the most dangerous thing I ever did, I did as a photographer. And that was uh, A, hang out of a helicopter. Huh. And B, climbed uh, the Brooklyn and Williamsburg and Manhattan bridges. Those, those that's pretty dangerous stuff. This picture you're looking at now, I shot that from outside the helicopter. I wasn't sitting in the seat, okay? <laughs> I was actually outside, standing on the, the skids and strapped in, uh, held on by uh, retaining straps. That's pretty scary shit. And for a guy who's absolutely petrified of heights, uh, it's even scarier. The only thing uh, going for me is that basically I can do anything with a camera in my hand. So, uh, you take the camera away, uh, it scares the crap out of me. This image you're looking at now, the basketball shot, that's probably my favorite picture I've ever made, ever, anywhere. Which one was that? That was beautiful. Can you go back to it? Uh, yeah, I'll go back to it. Uh, the basketball shot is that's here. almost shades of uh, Lou Alcinda shot by Abaddon. That's beautiful, Joe. Well, this... Uh, this picture came about, this is a direct result of a conversation I had with Jay Maisel. Oof. Jay said to me one day, no matter what you're shooting, always remember to turn around and look at what's going on behind you. It might be more interesting than what you came to see. And man, was he right. <laughs> he was right about that. Uh, I was shooting something else and I was waiting for the light to come down a little bit. And I turned around and walked to the other side of the rooftop that I was standing on and looked over the other side. And there were these guys playing basketball. And I got the uh, picture at just the right moment, handheld with a 300 millimeter. Um, How many exposures, I, Joe? Did what's you know, that? How many exposures did you, did you, you know, shoot off before you got the I don't know. Was a, I was using motor drives, so probably six or seven. Oh. But only one picture was, you know, was good. Of course. These are beautiful, Joe. God bless you. Man. Joe, how, how hard was it to get helicopters at the time of day that you wanted to go shoot? Uh, you pick up the phone. You call Pete Zanlogi and say, Pete, I want to take off at uh, 5. And he said, no problem. Is that right? It's a thousand bucks an hour. Mm -hmm. As long as you got a thousand bucks an hour, he'll take you wherever you want to go, whenever you want to go. Beautiful. Is he still doing it? He's, re he's probably retired. Right? Is he still doing it? I, I don't know. I haven't I haven't uh, chartered a helicopter over New York in at least 15 years, so I, I couldn't tell you. Uh -huh. Beautiful work, Joe. That's beautiful. I can tell you. So that's the New York stuff. And then I mentioned, I'll show you the flags I did. Yep. The other thing that I happen to like, uh, 
He's making pictures of people. Uh, a lot of people say they shoot portraits. Uh, as far as I know, you can only make a portrait if the person you're photographing knows you're photographing. If they don't know you're photographing them, it's not really a portrait, it's probably an action shot of some kind. But uh, portraiture is when they know that you're photographing them. This is uh, akin to uh, Jeff Shewe yelling at his, at his uh, sitters. Uh, I tried to get that dog to look at me, and finally I barked at him. I said, whoa. And the dog turned and looked. I nailed one frame. That's what I sent to the art director, one slide. She called me on the phone and said, uh, you know, uh, you only sent me one slide. And I said, Susie, that's the only one I want you to print. And you only need one anyway. And she told me never to do that to her again. But uh, she printed it. Everybody wants a selection. Uh, a lot of this portrait work, by the way, is not groundbreaking stuff. I, I don't, uh, I don't claim to be any kind of a groundbreaking uh, 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 photographer. Uh, I'm certainly not. But uh, my work was uh, commercially viable, and that's uh, what counts uh, when you're trying to earn a living. So I, I've spoken uh, to lots of groups, and you can always ask, you know, why did you become a photographer, a professional photographer? And people say, oh, I love communicating, or I want to influence this. Or, those are all the wrong answers. The answer is because I want to earn a living doing this. That's why you become a professional. And, uh, and it's not easy, as many of you know. And, but that's the only reason. You don't, want to be, you don't want to make money, become a dentist, buy as many cameras as you can afford, and go out and shoot pictures on your vacation. Is that your brother? That's my little brother. Yeah, it's yeah. the day he graduated from police academy. He came down to my studio, and I shot his picture there. Yeah. That's my brother who, who, who stopped and uh, stopped, stopped a woman from speeding one day. <laughs> and he, she wanted his, she was upset. She wanted to know his name. She said, what's your name? And he says, Pobreskin. You want me to spell it? And she says, no. So I can spell Pobreskin. He says, you can? He says, yeah. My husband's got, got he said, you, 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 one of your relatives is a photographer? He says, yeah, my brother. He says, my husband's got his poster in his office. I can spell the name. He gave it a ticket, by the way. He was not intimidated. They didn't take any shit on the street. So these uh, pictures you're looking at now, I get to uh, Chicago. I'm going to go back for a minute. Uh, I get to Chicago and uh, start to make some friends. And, uh, and I met this guy at a party. This guy, his name is Duffy Clark, and he's a rather infamous Chicago guy. Uh, Duffy was in prison for like 35 years for a murder that he swears he didn't commit. But he introduced me to a bunch of his uh, ex-convict buddies, all paroled murderers, which is what you're seeing now. And these guys were C, not what they call C number prisoners. They had been sentenced to indeterminate prison terms. Uh, things like, you know, 360 years to life, uh, stuff like that, stuff they were never going to get out of prison for. Uh, and the thing that's really surprising is they're all really nice guys. Uh, they just happen to kill people. Uh, so, <laughs> but photography will bring you into contact with a lot of interesting folks. And, so there's uh, a question over in the chat if these were done mostly ambient light or do you light all of these or is it uh, a mixture? Well, well, you, well, you're looking at now the SX70 stuff obviously is not lit. Uh, but the other stuff, the formal portraits are all lit unless they're out in the street, and you'll see what I'm talking about in, in a little bit. I this Joe, is a picture can of you my turn friend. your volume up a little bit on the iPad? Your your voice no, volume. Uh, and I can talk louder, but I don't know. If yeah, or louder. talk towards it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, someone is saying they haven't been breaking up, but I'm not hearing it breaking up here. Well, it depends on your internet, I guess. Um, this is not lit. Well, it is lit. It's lit by a window at sunset. Uh, this of course is outdoors this is on the street uh, that guy sitting on the bench in that camera he's a portrait photographer in a place called Farsava which is uh, on the north, north, northeast of Tel Aviv to about 20 kilometers this is not lit obviously uh, that's not lit 
but some of the earlier stuff you saw, uh, those were those rolled in. This guy I ran into in a hotel I was staying at in, uh, in Kyoto in Japan. And this hey, is what I Yeah. I don't mean to butt in. Do you have any photographs when you were living in the kibbutz when you went to Israel back in? Uh, uh, yeah, I have lots. Uh, you know, I don't mean to. You're not going to see them today. All right. Sorry. And Stephen's asking, how much of your work is assignment versus self-assignment? Yeah, I would say it was about 50-50. And Melissa was wondering if we'll get to see that baby that put your son through college. Yeah, I'll show you that. <laughs> <laughs> I can show that picture. Uh, it's not any slides. Les Paul's brother. Les Paul's brother, indeed. So these guys, these are all street musicians in New York. Uh, you know, I had, being a freelance assistant, I had a lot of free time on my hands. And I would roam uh, New York City with a Nikon F and a 28 millimeter lens, and sometimes a 43 to 86, and uh, photograph musicians uh, doing their thing. And I got to know I got to know all these guys. Uh, you take the time to get model releases from them. No, I don't want to release them. Those those are pretty much uh, fine art uh, things, I suppose. All right, let's see. What do you want to know about? You want to know about uh, about uh, the baby, the baby. I'm gonna find this for you. Oh boy! Uh, to be honest with you, I don't know which one it is. That's it. This is the picture you're asking about. Can you see that? Yep. And this is lit, by the way. So, I, you know, you want to scare a baby to death? Bring a couple of dino lights into his room. <laughs> and start, start making pictures. Uh, hey, it's better than a sun era. gun. What's that? Better than the Ascors. Yeah, it's better than the Ascors. I wasn't about to bring those into his room. Uh, I didn't have one anyway. Uh, this is... Uh, <laughs> this is my son at about about three months old. Uh, he was able to lift his head. And my friend Nancy had given us this mirror. And so he's uh, looking in the mirror. And you could tell that he, he's wondering, who is that guy in the mirror? Uh, and of course, I, I photographed this two ways, with the diaper and without the diaper. Uh, Tony Stone sold the one with the diaper. I like the one without the diaper best. But... Uh, that money made enough. That picture made enough money to send that kid to college three times over. And when he turned, uh, I don't know, twenty-five or so, put it up on uh, on Facebook on his birthday. And because Aaron lives in L.A. Uh, and I live in Chicago, if I put something at five o'clock in the morning, it's three a.m. in Los Angeles, so he doesn't see it. So all my friends are are writing in comments about, "Oh, he's going to kill you." Well, you know he's going to kill you, right? And everybody's saying he's going to kill you for that. He's going to kill you for that. And finally, Aaron wakes up and he writes, and Dad, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and I said, that picture has been circulating for 25 years. It's been published in 65 countries and made more than enough money to send you to college three times. Do you still want to kill me? That was, <laughs> that was. Where did you first sell it to? I mean, I, I, I'm having trouble wrapping my head around how a baby picture makes that much money. Where where did it start? Uh, I think it started in a magazine somewhere in Sweden. To be honest with you, I think that was the first sale of that image. Uh, it's hard to tell you precisely what sells and where. And the reason why is I'll get a, uh, I'll get a sales advice and it'll give me an image number. And they'll tell me, who's using it and for what period of time. But that doesn't mean I've heard of it. So I've had pictures. Uh, I've got a picture I made of the Statue of Liberty close up of the head, which was used to promote feminine hygiene products. It's been used in calendars. It's been used on posters. It's been used in, in all over the place. I mean, and, and that's why when people, uh, when people ask me, how much should I charge? Joe, what do you think I should charge to shoot this job? And I'd say, what are the parameters? And well, the customer wants, wants all rights. 
And so you got to add three or four zeros to whatever it is you're thinking of charging. And the reason why is all rights means they can use it for anything. A lot of time they want the copyright too. And they typically want to do it for the same amount of money they're going to pay you, they're going to pay somebody for one time rights. They offer you 500 bucks, but they want everything in perpetuity throughout the universe. And when you see it, what a stock picture like this can earn over its lifetime, then you realize what a single picture is worth for any number of given uses. So I would always say, you just got to keep adding zeros. Now, my favorite example is uh, a picture was made by a guy that I know marginally. His name is Chuck O'Rear. He's out in Seattle. And uh, he'd made a picture of uh, this grassy knoll with a single puffy white cloud in a beautiful, clear blue sky. <laughs> Nothing really earth shattering about that. It was nice landscape. I mean, not, you know, no Ansel Adams. But Microsoft used it to promote their Windows product. And it was on every package and every ad on everybody's screen all over the world for years. And they didn't get that for 500 bucks. It cost them like $130,000 to get all rights to that picture. So that's what stock picture could be worth. It could be that much, right? So uh, you got to figure out over, over time. And, and that's one of the things that stock really led me to was, was, was the awareness of how much a, a particular picture might be worth for you know, a multitude of uses. I mean, that, that's really the key. Uh, so where were we? Oh, well, this, this was, we were here, I believe. And this was the, uh, the last one in that series. So uh, we'll cut out of that. And then, uh, what else we got here? Oh, and then uh, it, it occurred to me that uh, I did a lot of uh, I did a lot of uh, pictures in New York, and I kind of became known for that in, in a certain way. But there's also uh, they would occasionally let me out of town. So these are the pictures I didn't shoot in New York. And this image is the one that Tony Stone saw that told me he liked and wanted to sign me up based on that one picture of a jet landing out in Denver at the airport. And they never, they never licensed that jet. But it got me in the door and that was, uh, this picture of the truck, that's the day Mount St. Helens blew up. I was out in the road collecting ash and film cans. Which is why the truck was kind of going around. It was out in Nevada. Also, Nevada. Nevada is a great place to take pictures. If you ever, if you ever want to go somewhere, go. Was that Highway 40? Highway 50. 50, that's it. 50. US 50, loneliest highway in America. You can go, you can fall asleep in the car, Tony. As long as your hands don't leave the wheel, you just keep going straight. Uh, you'll get there. <laughs> Did you have a favorite destination to go to? You know, my favorite place I've ever been, I think. Uh, was Istanbul. Mm -hmm. uh, Paris is not far behind. Uh, and certainly the best food I ever ate was in Italy. I'm just saying. But, uh, but I like, you know, I like, I like the desert Southwest. Done a lot of work in the Southwest. Uh, and there's a whole lot of places I haven't been yet. So all this shooting here, is this all 35 millimeter or two and a quarter? Or do you this is all 35. Large? All 35. All 35 millimeter, yeah. Even the portraits. What's that? Even the portraits are 35s. Well, except for the, uh, except for the pictures of the, the SX-70 pictures, which obviously are not yeah. 35. And the one shot of Vincent Sardi, which was shot with a Hasselblad. Okay. Yeah, but 35 millimeter is, is, is a good uh, it's a good format for a number of reasons. It, it, it's highly portable. Uh, and I remember I, I was sitting in my studio one day and my phone rang. 
And uh, the voice on the other end of the line says, uh, hey, my name is uh, John Dykstra. I work for Warner Brothers. And I said, uh, John Dykstra, you mean uh, Star Wars? John Dykstra? This to me, yeah. So what can I do for you? He said, well, I understand that uh, if I want to see pictures in New York, you're the guy to talk to. And I said, yeah, I, I could be the guy to talk to. What, what do you have in mind? He starts to tell me about, he's working on a new film called Batman and Robin. They're going to shoot it. You know, it's, it's Gotham City, which is basically New York, but uh, they're not going to shoot anything on location. It's going to all be done on a green screen. And they need pictures in New York that they can uh, scan and rebuild into the skyline of Gotham City. And so basically what he's telling me is every time you see Gotham City on the screen, you're looking at my pictures in New York, just chopped up, scanned, and put back together a little bit differently so that the building's different. And he wants me to shoot it four by five. And I said, you're nuts. First of all, I'm not gonna have the range of lenses in four by five. Secondly, four by five is incredibly time consuming. And thirdly, you're shooting a film in 35, aren't you? He says to me, yeah. I said, well, why can't I just uh, use Kodachrome? And he said, well, I'd like to see your stuff first. Can you send it out to me? How long will it take? Because he's in Hollywood and I was in New York. So I'll have it to you in three hours. And I got on the phone and I called Andrea Rosenfeld at Tony Stone Images in Los Angeles and told her to put together a selection of pictures. I gave her some picture numbers. And uh, she put together a selection, sent it over to Warner Brothers. And he had something to see in three hours, which I think impressed him <laughs> a little bit. And, um, sure and I got- beats FedEx. Job. Yeah, it beats the crap out of FedEx, yeah. And I got the job and I spent, you know, a couple of weeks photographing uh, for uh, Warner Brothers for Batman and Robin. So uh, that was kind of fun. And by the way, I, I live now in the Chicago area, so I've made a few pictures of Chicago, as you might guess. Uh, and uh, there's more to come, but I haven't scanned them all. This one here is, uh, is, is six different images. That's a Photoshop job. I think the shot a couple back of just the edge of the bean is probably the mm -hmm. most imaginative of any I've ever seen of the bean. Well, I'm glad you like that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I kind of like that picture. Uh, this one here. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's a great shot. That, that, I don't know if it's the most imaginative thing I've ever seen, but uh, good, good I, I, I don't, I don't, I've seen probably a thousand shots of, of the bean. I've never seen any that look like that. All right. So the bean is actually uh, a sculpture called Cloudgate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I uh, happen to meet a guy socially I go into his living room up in uh, Lake Bluff. And he's got a miniature of that sculpture on his uh, coffee table. And I said, gee, Jim, where'd you get that? I'd love to get one of those. <laughs> and he said to me, you can't get one. Because the reason I have it, because I'm the guy who built it. Apparently, he was the CEO of the foundation to provide the funding for that, for that sculpture to be made. So uh, it's kind of interesting to meet him. Do you remember the sculptor's name? Yes, the guy's name is uh, Kapoor. Uh, I'll tell you. Hold on a second. Uh, I gotta consult my other computer. Hold on. Because <laughs> he's got some other sculptures. I remember seeing one, I believe it was at the Museum of Modern Art, a done of mirrors that was really fun to play with and photograph. Yeah. Uh, I'm always particularly fond of his shots. Name is, his name is Anish Kapoor. Kapoor, that's right. Thank and you. He is a uh, he's a, uh, a British artist of Indian descent. Cool, Stephen, you were asking. I'm always particularly fond of shots where the photographer walked around and looked around, didn't just look at the subject, but looked behind him and around, and and that's that's. Just one of those shots where you you saw something that probably nobody else has seen. Well, that's uh, 
that may be the case. And, and again, that, that goes uh, back to having uh, having some good advice from a uh, from, from a mentor uh, like Jay Maisel. Uh, did you assist Jay? Jay? Or did I never did friends? assist Jay. They were just yeah. friends. But, did you get you know, to play uh, basketball? No, I never got to play basketball. Same probably beat, here. It'd probably beat me. Uh, <laughs> this shot here, uh, speaking of the bean, there's no way to shoot this freaking thing without being in a picture yourself. Uh, I had to retouch myself out. <laughs> uh, so the other uh, folks in the audience have questions for Joe. Comments. Yeah, Why the hell did you come to Chicago? Oh, you missed that part because my uh, ex-wife moved here with our kids, and I wasn't gonna, I wasn't going to uh, uh, be eight hundred miles from my children. So here I am, and to eat uh, substandard uh, Jewish deli food and substandard pizza. <laughs> <laughs> really good pizza. I actually become uh, become an aficionado of uh, Lou Malnati's deep dish. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They make a pizza called the Lou, which is uh, uh, it's kind of vegetarian. I mean, it's got cheese on it, but I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> the, no, no sausage, no pepperoni, but it's really, really tasty. Uh, and in right. fact, this stuff is so good that my brother Dave uh, orders it frozen, shipped back to New York. So well, you can get a good beef sandwich in Chicago. Yeah, but the thing is, nobody can explain to me. What makes Italian beef Italian? Uh, it's something I've been trying to catch on to for a long time, and I can't figure it out. Did you see Stavros's question over in the chat? I did not. What was the question? If you know how to shoot, you can. If you know what to shoot, you can make money. If you were to make a list of what to shoot, what would it be? <laughs> if I was to make a list, the list. Uh, I've got a list actually. Cats. Uh, it, it, it's long. <laughs> cats. Well, no, I can't shoot cats. I'm allergic to cats. But I'd be happy to look at Jeff's pictures of cats. Uh, but uh, I think uh, dogs, horses. Uh, I mean, if you want to make money as a stock photographer. Uh, uh, turn back the clock 20 years. <laughs> yeah, you have to turn back the clock 20 years. And, and there's, I mean, there's lots of things. The, the thing to shoot, obviously, is what interests you. Uh, if your heart's not in it, you're not going to make good pictures, no matter what it is. You know, I've got uh, one of my favorite things is uh, I don't know if I showed it to you. I didn't show it to you. Uh, but I'm going to show it to you now. Uh, You'll need to start your share again. Okay, I got to find it first anyway. So okay, you asked what makes Italian pizza Italian. No, no, what makes Italian beef Italian? Beef. Oh, beef. Oh, I'm sorry. There's this stuff that they sell called Italian beef. Mm. It's a sandwich. And it's not bad. Uh, but in answer to your question, out. it's the um, ingredients in the sauce that the beef is cooked in that makes it quote Italian beef. And there's a lot of juice to it, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, you gotta get it wet. I guess so. Yeah, I used to work in Chicago a lot, and that was always one of the first things we would do is is we'd get a beef sandwich, and then we'd get you know pizza, and that was you know, they always wanted all the all the folks from Chicago always wanted me to show show off their their favorite uh, restaurant. I like I like to shoot still lifes, believe it or not. If uh, if I had it, uh, if I was going to do anything new now, it would be still life. Uh, this old pair of basketball shoes that I had that people told me were too ratty to wear. Uh, so I, I, I'd rather, so before I threw them out, I photographed them. I thought that Can was, you just show the photo without starting the slideshow? Yeah, if I could find it, I could show it. Uh, I have to tell you, I have to look and see what number it is. Wait a minute. <laughs> uh, the mind is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> Or to lose. I or to lose. Twelve sixteen. Can I show you the picture? Yes, I can. Oops, oops. Show you the picture. 
I can show you the picture, image files, uh, master files. Twelve sixteen. I got this database, so I don't have to remember anything. Uh, yeah, so that's the picture. Uh, yeah, so you know, people are giving me grief because the shoes are coming apart, manholes in them, and uh, and I happen to like those shoes. You know, uh, I have four pair like that in my closet that I wear every day. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, finally, I think they. It got to be to the point where I walked in the room and you could smell my feet. So, uh, so they had to go, but not before I decided to keep them. Uh, and the best way to keep them is to take a photograph. Uh, so I did, but I like still life. And I spent a lot of time working for a still life photographer. I'll show you some more if I can. Um, uh, the thing about still life. Yeah. Joe, when, when did you live in a kibbutz? How long, when was that and for how long? Okay, so uh, I was in my sophomore year in college, 73. And uh, Yom Kippur War broke out. And I heard on the radio that they're looking for uh, volunteers. And I thought to myself, well, I could wait for life to send me off to a war. Or I could go on my own. So I went down to the Jewish agency on Park Avenue, knocked mm -hmm. on their door. The guy says through the door, says, go away. I said, no, you don't understand. <laughs> I, I want to volunteer. And the guy said to me, go away. <laughs> so go. I wouldn't go away. Where, so where, which, uh, where was the kibbutz? Uh, we had a nice chat. He produced a letter from the consul general. It's a place called Ramat HaKovesh. It's about uh, 20 miles northeast of Tel Aviv, uh, adjacent to... Uh, uh, a little Kfar town called Saba. Kfar Saba. And also, yeah, I know Kfar uh, Saba. And also, uh, half the kibbutz was, was in the occupied territory. It was in the West Bank, mm, uh, right. formerly West Bank. So uh, you had to go to work with rifles every day. Uh, and you're constantly getting shot at and getting rocketed at and stuff like that. But uh, I did some. I did the work of essentially of civilians because all the all the guys got drafted. So. Uh, you tell me it's a free card story. What's that? Tell them the story about how you pulled out your that card, the ASP card. Oh yeah, I gotten uh <laughs> well it's a Sorry. long story. I, I basically I gotten arrested by the by the army, by the IDF. I was trying to go to Ashkelon and um and uh they picked me up, they decided it wasn't I shouldn't be down there. Uh, and I was being questioned. I had this ASMP press card, <laughs> which I guess the Israeli army didn't know too much about. Uh, so I whipped it out and they decided to let me go. Uh, that, that's the short version, but uh, got me out of a little, little jam, so to speak. Um, have you been back? Have you been back to Israel since? Yeah, I have. Uh, okay. One of my favorite places, the only, one of the only places you can actually get a decent shawarma. So, uh, do you, do you know so, where the best falafel is in uh, Israel? Well, uh, I, I believe it's in Kfar Saba. Uh, uh, south, just south of there in uh, oh. Hod HaSharon. Okay. It's, so, it's because... so close, you're probably thinking of the same place, the Blue Shack. I don't, I don't remember. But uh, yeah. why, is, why is yours the best? It, it's just, it's been called that. It's actually been called a New York magazine once, the best <laughs> falafel in Israel. Well, and it's a little know. shack, a little shack that's like, I don't know, five feet by four feet out on the street. Yeah, that's the best kind of place. Yeah. Now here in Chicago, we've got uh, five feet by four feet. There's a place on Clark Street called, uh, and there's another one. Uh, they have another location on uh, North, North Avenue in Bucktown. It's called the Sultan's Marketplace. And they were actually uh, Lebanese guys. They make pretty mean falafel and shawarma, by the way. Uh, they do it right. Those guys do it right. It's just like, it's just like being on the street you know, mm -hmm. in Fasaba or wherever. <laughs> but uh, do you guys remember name, you guys that? remember a name, Mandy Rice Davies? No. Nope. Don't know? No. Nope. Jack, no? No, Mandy right now. Mandy Rice Davis was the was the uh, 
was a madam that just about took down British Parliament. And oh. um, that was a long, long time ago. Uh, but that she, uh, but she went to Israel, and while in Israel, um, she opened up four excellent restaurants. I was in all four. Food snob, Maybe, right? Huh? Are you, are you a food snob? I can't hear you. Are, are you, you a food, food snob? snob? What? Food are you a food snob? snob. A fruit snob? <laughs> a food <laughs> snob. That, yes. That, no, yes. no, no. Are you kidding? I'll eat, I'll eat trait with the rest of you. Okay. <laughs> you kidding? So so Joe, talking... back to your still lives here. Yeah, so I, I happen to like still life. Uh, and the only reason I, I chose not to do it as a thing was because uh, I learned it from Hashi. And working in his studio was like working, it was like living in a submarine. We were in there 20 hours a day, six days a week. And uh, I wanted to get out from time to time. But I can shoot still life, as you can see. Uh, and of course, so when we talk about stock, you find your, your pictures show up in interesting places. Uh, one day, I opened out, one Sunday I went down to the newsstand, got a, a Times, I'm sitting there having coffee and a bagel, and I'm going through the magazine and I see this picture, this, this Joseph Babu dad. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, Damn, that picture looks familiar. And I go into my uh, files and I start comparing little details like the bus on the position of the traffic in the street. And I realized that this is a picture I had made in color. They converted it to black and white. And of course, I hadn't seen it in, in my sales advice. So I was wondering if I got ripped off. But uh, a couple of weeks later, when I got my sales advice from Stone, this picture, my 37% was $11,000. <laughs> so that paid for the helicopter uh, and then some. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that you could, you could get from stock. Uh, and they're not all that big, you know, that big a deal. Uh, but these little sales of a couple hundred here, a couple hundred there, uh, it piles up. And on an average month, you know, my stock sales are, you know, in the five figures. Uh, routinely so uh it, it led me to believe that, that the clients uh didn't really know what was going on uh, but i did that's how i made a living for a while cool so, so joe, uh, yeah joe, let me ask a question where uh where do you see yourself or what are you planning to do from here forward um well if i ever retire i'm going to uh travel with a camera, obviously, uh, and go to all the places I have not yet been. And uh, that, uh, that's a long list. What I'm gonna do with the pictures, I haven't a clue. I don't know how I'm gonna market that stuff. Um, I, I, I see uh, a lot of my friends have websites that are trying to sell fine art prints for thousands of dollars per print. And I don't know if anybody's buying that stuff or not. Uh, but I, I imagine uh, I'll get back in the internet business, open a website, and uh, and try that. I don't know. I'm not going to be one of those guys who goes around from town to town with a booth and hanging up his prints on the weekends. I'm not, I'm not doing that. I don't see that as a viable business uh, for me. I don't know. Uh, key is that uh, I love making pictures. I'm going to be doing that forever anyway. So, uh, you know, who knows? Are you selling the images yourself or do you have other uh, agents doing it for you? I've got two agents currently. One is called Miro, which produces practically nothing. And the other is called AGE Photostock, uh, which produces a small amount of money. But basically, it, it, there's no money coming in from photography these days, not from stock. It's, what it's about, a thing in the what, past. What, what about organizations like SD and... Uh, uh, you know, the, the oh, that's for crafts. And it's what? It's for crafts. You know, if I made you no know, beaded necklaces and stuff, I guess I'd be on Etsy. But I don't. I'm a photographer. Uh, and I see all these uh, ads on Facebook about uh, having an art store. For, I don't believe any of that shit. Um, 
until I actually meet somebody who's making money. So you're out on the web. I'm going to conclude it's not really a thing. Yeah, well, the I've only people point. making money in stock right now are the ones that put uh, a full time job into it. I mean, they're 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 putting pictures up every day or every week, and they're they're curating and and making sure. But it's it's pennies per picture. But if you sell hundreds of pictures, the pennies add up. But to dollars. Uh, well, I mean, the thing is. <laughs> The thing is yeah. that I could not, uh, I, I was just, I had, I had a great deal. I had, I was represented by Getty Images, the largest picture, picture company on the planet. And I made a lot of money for a long time, but they kept wanting to change the terms of the deal. And every time they wanted to change the terms, the terms got worse. And, uh, and I and, and some friends of mine uh, went to considerable effort to uh, to retain our uh, our rights in the images at, at rates that we felt were sustainable, uh, but Getty wanted to cut it cut us down. They wanted to give, first it was fifty percent, then it was forty percent, then they want twenty percent. Now they want twelve percent. I don't know what I don't know what they're paying anymore. I walked away from that uh, because we spent. I I, I started a uh, a trade association with, with three friends of mine. And we called it the Stock Artist Alliance. And we hired a high-powered New York intellectual property attorney. And, uh, and we went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mark Getty and, and John Klein. And, uh, and it basically just resulted in, in the fact that uh, even though we signed up like you know, 900 guys, which was the bulk of their, of their contributors, uh, pretty much a lot of people just caved anyway. We did get a better deal out of them. But uh, over time, it just kept being whittled down to the point where I said to myself, there's no way they deserve 88% and I should get 12%. And, uh, and unless that changes, and I don't think it's going to, I'm not going back down that road. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to license my images for 18 Going seconds. in a different, yeah. I've got a question coming in from Facebook from Charlie Gibson saying, what is your travel gear these days? Uh, these days, I'm pretty much carrying a, a little backpack. And then I've got, uh, I've got a, uh, a Canon uh, EOS 5D digital. Obviously, I, I carry a, a fisheye 16. I carry a 50 micro. 28 to 28 to uh, 20 to 35, 28 to 70, 70 to 200, and a 300, and a 2x extender, and a Leica Deluxe 3. That's my pack. A couple of filters and electronic releases, and uh, that's a pretty heavy a, pack. Uh, yeah, a, a, what's, too. what's the name we of your chiropractor? Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I do have a bad back. Uh, in, in fact, no, and a truck. You went to truck. So are you do are you doing your own Photoshop work? Yeah, I do my own Photoshop work, but I don't do like anything surreal. Mm -hmm. uh, your volume dropped again, Joe. I'm sorry. I, I don't do any. I'm not into surrealism per se. Uh, if I do Photoshop work, it's like to take myself out of the take my reflection out of the cloud gate sculpture, or uh, you know, it's, it's got to look real. I mean, it's got to look like this picture was made for real. I will occasionally drop a moon in here and there, here or there, uh, or uh, or something like that. But basically, it, it's got to look real to me. Uh, I'm not interested in uh, you know doing the kind of things that uh, I don't know Michelle Trevkov does with his flowers or. Uh, Joe, do you have anything. international representation? What's that? You have international representation. Well, AGE is pretty much international. ADE. A G E. Oh, A G E. A G E stands for Alfonso Gutierrez Escada. He's the principal owner of A G E Photo Stock. He's an honorable guy. Uh, doesn't make me a whole lot of money, but uh, he's honorable. I would never drop a moon into a photo. <laughs> Very good. Uh, let's see. So Stavros was asking, with so many images being on film, how daunting of a project was it for you to digitize your stock library? Assuming you've I'll let him know when all. I'm finished. <laughs> okay. I'm not done yet. 
I've got a, a small a small fraction of, of my stuff has been scanned. Um, and uh, I just bought a new scanner, a new slide scanner. So uh, I'm getting uh, very enthusiastic about the- uh, What are you scanning with? I bought myself a, uh, a plus tech optic film, uh, what's the model number? Uh, Well, uh, 8,100, 82, whatever, whatever it is. In fact, uh, I found out that at the same time, because great minds think alike, uh, Seth Resnick bought the same scanner. I have uh, the same scanner also. Yeah. Joe, so, what are you uh, storing your uh, old images? How do you keep your uh, old slides staying fresh and new? Is there I keep them secret? in a climate, climate controlled uh, file. Okay. Essentially. Cool. Yeah. Good for you. Uh, the good news is that most of what I shot was on Kodachrome. And Kodachrome doesn't fade. So mm -hmm. uh, in dark so storage. Just don't in dark project storage. Them. It, it's in the dark, yeah. yeah. I don't lay them out on the on, on, on the backyard deck, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't take them out for a little sunlight from time to time. No, they they stay dark, they stay cool, they stay dry. And that's what I'm doing. Cool. Yeah, so does anyone else I'll, have questions? Occasionally I'll find uh, something that is not in pristine condition, in which case I've got uh, I've got this. Can you see this? Sure. <laughs> Here, let me close your screen. Yeah. Stop your like, share. I don't know how to do that, but uh, I'll do it. Find, yeah. Now you can hold I've, it up. I've got this stuff. It's called Kodak film cleaner. It's remarkable. Uh, <laughs> if my car runs out of gas, I could probably prime it with this, with this too. Uh, hey, Joe, you want to talk some... about um, uh, uh, registering images? Do I want to talk about registering images? I register everything. Absolutely everything. I have for a long time. If I take snapshots of my kids, it gets registered. Uh, what I used to do was I used to uh, have a job and I'd register the copyrights before uh, I turn in the film. So everything I'd shot between the last time I did it and this job that I'm registering today got tacked onto that registration and I built my client. Uh, so on every, on every one of my invoices, there was a line item that said copyright registration, $35. And everything I'd shot up to that point from the last job that I registered uh, would be registered. And typically, you know, I was shooting an assignment a week or at least once every two weeks or whatever. So it wasn't always that much, but the copyright registration comes in handy. I'll tell you why. I got a call one day from a friend of mine who was an art buyer at an ad, ad agency called Great Scott up on Fifth Avenue. And uh, Nancy calls me and tells me that she's got a job that's right up my alley. I said, oh, yeah, what is it? She says, planes and trains. I said, oh, yeah, <laughs> that is right up my alley. That is, my, that is up my alley. Uh, who's the client? The client is Trump Shuttle Airlines. Donald Trump had just purchased the Eastern Airlines shuttle. Now, my friend Mark, one of my best friends, married a woman uh, who had been the assistant project manager on Trump Tower when they were building that. And she told me all these stories about how Donald Trump stiffs his contractors. So I had a sneak suspicion that uh, if I shot this job, somebody somewhere was going to try to stiff me. And, uh, but I took it anyway. I, I got an advance from the ad agency, went out in the shot, shot the ads, and uh, I'm not going to bother with the screen here again. You can see them if you want somewhere else. Uh, and I shot the ads and I built them. And at the end of 30 days, uh, I hadn't gotten paid. So I waited another couple of days. And I called Nancy on the phone and said, hey, uh, am I going to get paid for the, uh, for the airline job? And she said to me, oh, you got to talk to uh, talk to Chuck in bookkeeping. I forget the guy's name, Chuck, Eric, or whoever he was. So I, I called Eric and I said, and he tells me, oh, yeah, I see the answer. They're running everywhere. They're great. They're beautiful. They love them. I said, great. And I said, am I going to get paid for that? Because it's been like, you know, 40 days. And uh, I haven't seen a check yet. And he says, oh yeah, I've been meaning to call you about that. 
bullshit. He made it to call me. He didn't mean to call me at all. Uh, he told me that uh, they, they had to kind of deal with the Trump organization and they were going to get uh, 10 cents on the dollar. So that's what they were going to do with all of the subs on this account. So they owed me like 17 grand and, uh, and they wanted to pay me 1700. And I said, no, you don't understand. I said, uh, you owe me like $17,000. And he said to me, well, I'm sorry, but we, you know, it's a deal we made with Trump. I said, yeah, but I didn't make a deal with Trump. I made a deal with you guys. And because my lawyer is a very sharp shark by the name Greenberg told me, never to sign a customer's purchase order, always present your own paperwork. They signed my paperwork, right? So I told him, I said, look, I said, you got a choice. Uh, you guys owe me $17,000. I didn't work for Trump. I worked for you. I don't care what kind of deal you have with them. My deal is with you. And I intend to collect on this invoice you got until 10.30 tomorrow morning to have a check on my desk or at 11. A fellow by the name of Edward C. Greenberg Esquire is going to walk in to the Southern District, the Federal Court in the Southern District and sue you for copyright infringement. And you can explain to your boss how you cost him $900,000 plus court costs and attorney's fees for copyright infringement when you can settle the whole thing for 17000 and next day, I had a check for 17400 whatever it was, I checked. Because uh, they signed my paperwork, and it was ironclad. And that was that. And I registered my copyrights, and I could prove it. And that's the value of registering copyrights. Nowadays, it's a whole lot easier uh, than it used to be. I used to take all these pictures, put them in slide pages, put them on the light box, re-photograph them, so I get 20 pictures in an image, and register a bunch of, uh, a bunch of, single image, a bunch of slides with 20 pictures in each one. And nowadays you do it online, so you basically fill in the form, attach, attach your little JPEGs and uh, zip them off, and that's how they go. And if you want to learn, learn the nuts and bolts of it, uh, I can tell you that there's a better resource than me, and he's in the other corner of my screen. His name is Jack, <laughs> with Nicky Jack. Uh, in fact, Jack has talked about it on this forum. So you can yeah. search YouTube and get the entire tutorial on how to register your copyrights. Which is something everybody online. ought to do all the time. It's worth every penny. Yeah. I'd also yeah. point out uh, very quickly that Jack is looking absolutely cinematic today. Uh, yeah. I don't know what his lighting and his background is just, he's really one up. I think to, he turned on the blur he's, filter in, got the in blur Zoom. Filter on. Yeah, that's it. It's the blur <laughs> filter. It's, it's actually a poorly lit uh, office. No, well, I'm very impressed. Very impressed. I like that Jeff sits in front of a painted backdrop every time he comes on this thing. So, Joe, any of the things you want to talk about today? Oh, anything I want to talk? Yeah, let's. Uh, I just want to say that the uh, most important thing to know about being a photographer is getting out of the chair. Uh, most important thing you got to do is get out of your chair. Uh, don't sit behind the desk. Go out and make pictures. If you're not out there making pictures, you're not a photographer. It's that simple. It doesn't matter what kind of pictures you make. You can photograph your toes on the beach, uh, but uh, two, two pictures every day. That's the most important thing to know. Uh, again, you know, I, I remember uh, being in a, some kind of uh, presentation Jay Maisel was talking about, and he said, how many of you guys photographers have everybody raised their hand? And he said, how many of you guys have your cameras with you? And almost nobody raised their hand. <laughs> and he said, you can't be a photographer unless you have a camera. So always carry a camera. I, I think the guy took his camera in the bathroom uh, <laughs> just in case something happened in there. But uh, yeah, I've always got a camera of some kind, whether it's a phone or my little, my little compact Leica Deluxe 3 or my Canons or whatever. Uh, there's always a camera around. And my kids are always saying to me, dad, put the camera away. People are always complaining about it, but uh, I'm making good pictures with it, so. Cool, well, thank you. Anybody got Any questions? questions from the audience before we sign off? Yeah, Joe, do you ever get downtown? I do, Jeff, we should have lunch somewhere. Yeah, I'm in uh, Roscoe Village. All right, I know where that is. Used to be on the, used to be uh, in Lincoln Park, right? <clears throat> yeah, I used to be, I sold the uh, 
<clears throat> studio in the house and <clears throat> bought a new house. My uh, <clears throat> my son used to work at uh, my oldest son when he was in high school. Uh, one summer he was cooking out of Linea, which was just a half a block from where you are, I think. And I uh, a couple blocks, with, but yeah, a Linea. I used to sit in the, in the alley behind the restaurant waiting to pick him up at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, and uh, saying to myself, oh, Jeff lives right up the street. <laughs> but yeah, let's definitely do that. Because otherwise I got to hear John say, hey, do you know Jeff Shoot? <laughs> uh, another couple of dozen times. Actually, John, we have met. Jeff and I were, uh, spoke at a, uh, what was it, PACA conference? I don't remember when it was. Got to be a while ago. We did some well, town. Well, might have been PACA. Yeah, I think it was. And uh, oh. we're, talk we're talking about stock photography. And uh, I think we did a little Getty bashing and a couple other, <laughs> couple other little bits. But uh, yeah, let's let's de definitely do that. I'm well, down just a time. reminder that next week it'll be here on Wednesday instead of Thursday with Art Wolf. Uh, so Art be Wolf sure to check, Art Wolf check in great. on that one. Art Wolf's a great photographer. I've been admiring his work for a long time. So I want to thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Joe, for presenting. Thank um, you. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm glad that uh, a couple of people showed up. Yeah. So hey, I'm John, did you like the shots of you? Yes, I did. Enjoyed them quite a bit. I want to I will, oh, I'll, um, I'll send you the uh, adjusted raw files as, oh. as a Lightroom catalog. Great. I forgot Great. to thank wear you. my pink hat today. I <laughs> I'm going to... So I everyone say thanks, hat. and I'm going to stop the recording. So thank you, Joe. Thank you, John, and everybody.